practical introduction to polar codes. In the last three parts, we have discussed uh, several basics of polar codes, some brief introduction to polar codes, and then we discussed the construction of polar codes, and then we discussed the encoding part of polar codes. Now we are going to discuss the remaining most exciting part of polar codes, namely the decoding of polar codes. So as I was saying, there are three main the, the three main blocks are code construction, encoding, and decoding, and we are going to see decoding. Yeah. So what is decoding? So this is very exciting because uh, the decoder is something very simple, which is called successive cancellation decoding. Uh, in short, SCD. Uh, so this is a very fundamental and simple decoder that is proposed as a recursive algorithm in back in Rickens paper. Uh, so this is uh, even though this is like a vanilla plain vanilla decoder. Uh, this is this is known to have relatively though it has an impressive performance for its uh, complexity uh, it is uh, inferior to other decoders therefore people have uh, improved upon it but all the time uh, this understanding this decoder is very critical because this is going to be a fundamental block for those advanced and more efficient decoders so in that way, without uh, learning successive cancellation decoding, polar codes are not complete at all. So um, successive cancellation decoding is a very simple algorithm in, in the sense that it is a simple tree search. It's a greedy tree search because uh, uh, in the traditional literature of coding theory, decoding can be described as a tree search. So we have uh, 2 power k possible code words essentially that is a path that can be traversed in a tree that has 2 power k leaves. Now uh, we have uh, a, a, a similar tree for any linear coding, linear code and now we have uh, a, a polar code which is also linear. So s here instead of searching the binary tree in the most exhaustive way what we essentially do is going in a greedy fashion by selecting one good link every time but still we achieve capacity achieving performance asymptotically that is the in impressive part of these polar codes so successive cancellation decoding which is a greedy algorithm which will get you the best ever thing that you can ever get that is the impressive part so uh, this is also a two way recursive algorithm uh, i may not have uh, said it very clearly uh, the encoding can also be represented as a two way recursive algorithm because uh, at every step we there is a recursion going on as a kronecker product with the same matrix this can also be represented as a recursive algorithm code construction is already explained in the form of a simple recursive algorithm and even decoder is also a recursive algorithm if you carefully observe so that's a two way recursive algorithm again so it takes n likelihoods as an input which are essentially the likelihoods of the received symbols as it is so n bits are transmitted over the channel we have received the uh, noisy version of those n, n bits and now we have n likelihoods as the input to this decoder uh, likelihoods are directly computed from the received symbols uh, those likelihoods are transformed into n other likelihoods of the message bits in d basically so d is the uh, d is the vector in which frozen bits and the message bits are embedded in a particular order as you have seen in the encoding step. So that D is going to be decoded which essentially means we are decoding the message itself because rest all are zeros which are known already. So um, so these decoding of uh, this particular decoding of D is going to happen in a sequential fashion that is another important property that has to be kept in mind. So we are not going to get all bits at a time rather we get one bit at a time in a in a uh, probably in an iteration so yeah so each iteration will give you one bit including frozen bit and in n iterations you get all bits including the frozen bits though they are known we we pretend that we are decoding them that's how it goes so um yeah how, what is that uh, two way recursion two way recursion that happens on the likelihoods that are being given to the uh, to this decoder as an input so if you give two likelihoods because it's a two re two way recursion we can simply represent by this small fundamental block this will expand to the uh, any exponentially large uh, size uh, decoding step so in this small block the very fundamental construction block um, uh, we have two likelihoods given two likelihoods are transformed to two other likelihoods as two two variable functions 
so those two variable functions are described here the second function is kind of a slightly special thing because it has two variants this is going to depend on a bit that is going to be decided on the upper branch which is not which may or may not be directly related to the uh, may not be directly computed from the likelihood that is available uh, if it is okay you, you will see the details in the next slide so in a way this likelihood either directly decides the bit here or it will lead to lead to the decision uh, it will lead to the decision of some other bit at a later stage and that bit will indirectly decide this bit so directly or indirectly this a uh, particular likelihood function small f is going to decide what bit that is going to come on this branch and that bit will decide what function is going to be used for g if the bit that is on the upper branch is zero then the function is a product of two likelihoods if it is a one then it is a division of the likelihoods that's all that's all about it so that bit is something critical which which is uh, called as broadcasting of bits from the left hand side of the circuit that we'll see soon in the next uh, slide so basically it's a two variable two variable recursion two two way recursion with two two variable functions yeah that's all so just to say some small issue before we proceed to the more detailed uh, explanation so usually because the polar codes are used at higher block lengths uh, the numerical precision issues will vary very quickly arise at uh, around block lengths like uh, uh, 128 to 56 itself you will see you will get to see the likelihood ratios uh, be being under flowing so those uh, likelihood ratios are not directly usable so just use log uh, domain calculations in that sense to uh, to avoid the underflow that is what is usually suggested so in general likelihood log likelihoods are always preferable uh, because of some uh, explicit hardware reasons or computational advantage reasons or anything but here it is very essential because underflow is inevitable if you use the standard floating point representation floating or double point uh, double precision uh, representation of uh, uh, real numbers so uh, in that log domain representation the functions become uh, might look slightly complicated but they are still simple and more exciting part is when those complicated po functions have a very simple approximations these are very efficient approximations they give you very efficient uh, uh, very efficient uh, um, performance at the end of the day so they won't get you any significant loss in the performance so that is exciting so uh, this is the numerical issue so just think that just assume that uh, though we explain for brevity we use only linear uh, domain uh, formulas but in general in a program or in a real time implementation it is always preferable to use log domain values and log domain formulas this is a simple straightforward uh, calculations so what is happening um, here is a very fundamental block before we get to the details of uh, actually this is uh, this th this slide will explain you the critical component of decoding and this is pretty much pretty much covers the main part of the decoding so assume that there is a computational tree so you have a s capital n number of likelihoods lying in the at one end of the circuit uh, they can be converted sequentially to n by 2 n by 2 values in the first stage and then they can be converted to n by 4 values in the next stage and so on till you get a unique value and this is what i call as a computational tree so this is a tree of computations which will get you a unique value at the end of the day so only variant that is going to happen is what operation are you using to obtain one value from two two values so each pair of values is generating a unique value and eventually you get only one value from out of uh, even though you started with capital n number of values so how, how are you going to generate at each level the half number of values is going to change so uh, the tree is the same except for the kind of operations that you are going to be used at different levels it's as simple as that so uh, for for each variety of tree for each combination of tree you are going to get a different likelihood and that likelihood is going to appear at this side at this side and once you get a likelihood at this stage you can simply make an ml decision to make to decide either zero or one 
and that bit once you know the bit something else will happen so what is that what that is simply broadcasting those bits back that we'll see very soon don't worry about that so uh, for now just see that there is a tree of computations so the tree varies only in the way the two operations are distributed at different levels and there are small n levels all the time and one interesting part here is this particular tree after certain level you see that the rest of the levels uh, some of the levels are already computed so for redundancy sake you may inactivate those redundant calculations because these operations are already computed which we, we simply don't do them anymore because these values are already available we simply use them that's all that's as simple as that so this is also not difficult so some after uh, so after certain levels some values are av already available so we inactivate certain levels they they are always in the right hand side of the circuit and interesting thing is uh, once you make some of the levels as inactive because of the availability of nodes the last active level is always full of g functions g functions that is another observation in these set of computational trees there are capital n number of computational trees and small g is going to be used only at the last active level or not at all because the very first iteration that you are going to see in the next slide it doesn't have any g operation at all because the very first slide will replace all f operations but in the but in every other likelihood computation the rest of n minus 1 likelihood uh, computational trees uh, they do they are going to have some inactive level or not but last level is always g full of g values and the another thing is g function computation will not appear anywhere in the rest of the tree so g is exclusive to the last active level if at all is there and rest all uh, branches are going to be rest all active branches are going to be f computations that is the interesting part so uh, all these n computational trees may seem very huge because there are n number of n uh, small n uh, i mean uh, it's, it's a big tree uh, each time and there are capital n number of such trees interesting thing is they they can be stored in a simple array itself that's what you are already seeing at this stage in this representation you see that each tree is coming out of this simple rectangular array so the number of elements is actually n times capital n so this is uh, this is capital n small n is log n lo log of uh, log base 2 of s capital n so this is already n log n memory is involved in here and you are already seeing one node each uh, so if you say each node is one bit or s one bit and one likelihood uh, so there are uh, capital n order of uh, computations that are going on if you keenly observe so already you can see the number order of n log n popping up here so this rectangular array is important that we are going to see in the next slide as well so, and that's what i have been explaining so you input n likelihoods at one side and you get output n outputs n likelihoods here n likelihoods here but in a sequential fashion after each computational tree now the the details are slightly uh, getting uh, revealed so i think half of the decoder is already explained because the decoder is essentially n capital n bits are output uh, n uh, okay the decoder is going to output capital n likelihoods and capital n likelihoods are resulted from capital n number of unique computational trees which have interesting properties as i have been explaining the distribution of f's and g's and number of active levels and so on so this act, uh, so unless we know how many levels are active we may not be able to proceed further and there is a simple formula for knowing it at at an arbitrary index this computational tree that that is going to arise is going to have some fixed number of active levels that can be easily computed by looking at the binary representation of two as a, as i will be explaining in the next slide so now i'll try to concisely say what is actually happening in the decoder so likelihoods are have to flow from right hand side to the left hand side once we get a likelihood at the right uh, at the left hand end of the circuit we make a decision we calculate a bit and that bit will be broadcasted 
to the right hand side of the circuit so bit the so the like loads will be flowing in this direction and bits will be flowing from this direction <coughs> excuse me so um yeah uh, so you you are already seeing the flow of the values now we'll see uh, how these uh, this computational trees will uh, go ahead so one interesting formula so if you if you are if you are taking a particular uh, tree uh, the root is going to have certain index uh, that root node index will decide how many active active uh, levels are going to be there it is simply number of consecutive zeros in binary i starting from msb for example zeros binary representation is all zeros three zeros it has from msb onwards three consecutive zeros therefore you are going to have 3 plus 1 if at all possible so 4 at most four, uh, I mean 4 active levels because the tree is always 3 uh, level 1 level 2 level 3 level 1 level 2 level 3 uh, 3 levels of uh, active levels are possible um, oh sorry so this this is level 1 this is level 2 and this is level 3 so there are only three levels that are possible so four means we have full three active levels okay uh, hopefully that is not very confusing to you uh, let's take another example so if you take index four the four index can be represented as uh, one zero zero in three bit representation there are no consecutive zeros from msb onwards therefore zero number of consecutive zeros plus one so the tree that is going to be rooted at four will have only one level of active tree that you will see very soon so this is the computation if it is zero one zero then there is one consecutive zero from msb therefore there are going to be two active levels this is the computation that's all i'm saying in case it is exceeding three you truncate it to n that's what it, this statement is saying because it doesn't make sense to have four active levels because the maximum number of levels is only three this is not a level so this is the level because you have to take two values and compute to one this is one level so if you take it uh, uh, this this is one level and then uh, this is another level and this is another level i mean just the note uh, just the uh, proper uh, noting of stages uh, and decisions are only made at the root level so let's see what happens in the next level once we have made a decision at this stage or 0 or 1 or 1 so that bit decision will be stored at this node and uh, because these two like roots are already available and this bit index is all bit uh, decision is also available this this particular node can be computed using function g because it's a lower branch uh, this is going to use the function g because it the even this bit is also available now so this function can be fully computed by using these two as a product or a, or a division so now you have a bit here as well so these bits now will be broadcasted to these nodes so pre, uh, as a result of past two iterations we have a bit here b0 we have a bit at 4 b4 and these four bit these bits are uh, broadcasted to this level that is b0 xor b4 this is b4 as it is so that's how bits are flowing from the left hand side to the right hand side because of the availability of these two bits the there are certain nodes so in this particular uh, 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 fundamental block uh, because the bit at this stage is available you can compute at this uh, uh, what the likelihood is going to be at this stage because the function g has to be computed and g uh, for g, for computing g you have to know the bits uh, the likelihoods at this stage and also the bit at the upper branch and that bit is now available because of the last two iterations so we'll compute g here and you have two likelihoods available uh, therefore you can compute index 2 the likelihood 2 is available here therefore you will make a bit decision of 2 and therefore because the bit is available here and these two likelihoods are also available here next iteration the likelihood at 6 will be computed 
that tree will be very short because the likelihoods are already computed and now you are simply propagating them using the decision at 2 at 2 so you already have bit 2 bit 0 is already computed bit 4 is also computed now bit 2 availability enables the uh, likelihood computation at 6 as a result you can also make a decision there therefore you'll have bit 6 as well because you have these two bits you can propagate them now you have bits at this phase as well so uh, so these bits will be propagated now you have lots of bits as you see the bits are being filled up so now you have bits at this stage that means you can compute this XOR operation and propagate the bits to this level as well and so on this is very systematically formulated uh, I mean uh, even though it might look slightly random because uh, you clear you may not be able to say what bit will come after a certain index unless you see the picture and observe this particular unit circuit it may not be clear to you after a certain index what will index will come so that is also been resolved all the, the, the this order of indices that is happening on the le left hand side is simply the bit reversed indexing linear order that is the bit reversed order as I was saying here so which means uh, the natural order usually expected is 0 1 2 3 4 and so on up to 7 just take the bit reversed versions 0 4 sorry this is 4 and then 2 becomes 2 because uh, 0 1 0 even after reversing will be 0 0 1 0 3 will become 6 4 will become uh, 1 and 7 will be remain as 7 so this is the order that is exactly going to be followed on the left hand side circuit so this is kind of very easy because the depth of the active tree is also known and so on actually you can program it in a very efficient fashion so don't worry about the computational complexity of uh, searching or anything uh, searching is a very poor implementation if you had to do really because there is a highly uh, structured computation that are going on in the circuit you have to understand where these exhausts and all and you can simply write a simple computer computer program or you can refer to the reference implementation that i have provided in my code base I was using a very efficient implementation of that you can think of that uh, in your uh, uh, spare time so uh, it's a very efficient implementation worth pursuing if you want to really pursue polar codes in a detailed fashion otherwise you can simply take the module that I have provided and use it for decoding some longer black longer block lengths of codes so um, yeah so this so just three things are to be noted as I have noted here so the bit reversed indexing order is the first thing and then the active uh, depth of the tree that is the second thing and the ml bit decisions that are to be made only at the left hand side of the circuit they have to be broadcasted to the rest of the circuit but not made i mean once you know the likelihood immediately you should not make a decision at the rest of the nodes unless it is the left hand end of the circuit so uh, so you have seen pretty much what is happening so um, the 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 number of computational trees finally fill it up and at the end of the decoding you have every node with an available bit that means you know the full circuit also the bits at the left hand end of the circuit which is essentially d itself including the frozen bits uh, uh, one thing i have not mentioned is so whenever you have a likelihood computed at a particular index if it is frozen then you force the decision to be zero but not make a decision using the likelihood so irrespective of the likelihood just take the frozen bit if it is a frozen bit index otherwise you make an ml decision ml decision so this ml bit decision is made only at the root and also and only at uh, an information bit index index at uh, frozen bits are forced forced so even if you broadcast the forced decisions are broadcasted that is very important because that is the critical for critical element of the performance so that's the end of this thing so just uh, I mean if you don't bother about the details you can simply take this code so just uh, simulate some uh, AWGN channel then you take this simple statement and that will decode 
for you and you can just compare whether the decoded symbol is exactly same as the message even after adding noise just by using this small code and the code base is completely available at this link so let's see um, so we have seen I think we have finished uh, the encoding decoding blocks so let's see some performance plots so just to remove your uh, trouble of uh, writing another code for just plotting some things I have also provided uh, I mean that the the code base that I have provided also includes a plot PC command which will which will essentially uh, plot plot the thing and return some good stuff as well so after you initialize properly these values will be fed into uh, this function as an argument and this function will call init PC which will run the construction part and then it will get ready the encoder and decoder uh, and then the it will also run the encoder decoder for a for a thousands of uh, symbols and then plot the error curves and for you so that will be as simple as this so once you run that command it is very simple it will give you the frame error rate and the bit error rate in a very simple efficient fashion so this last argument might be interesting for you I mean I mean this is not very critical so it just says don't print too much of output I said don't print too much of output except the very essential parts so this is what is required that's all so uh, what will happen now as a result of uh, using this polar codes so these are this is something of very critical for anyone who is interested in polar codes and want to use them in practice so if you use the plain vanilla successive cancellation decoder uh, if you use as high block length as 64,000 block length so okay let, let me show you what are these curves first so these four curves are the polar coding curves these are polar coding curves these are the fundamental bounds theoretical bounds they are that are possible for certain codes so this is the fundamental limit for uh, thousand length uh, um, uh, code linear code and this is for 64 thousand block length code this is for any length linear code or block code uh, this, this limit cannot be broken this is the fundamental Shannon capacity uh, the Shannon wall and these are the Shannon wall kind of the anal analogous channel walls for those block length the so-called uh, finite block length capacity results that are found by Yuri Polyansky in a very recent uh, PhD thesis uh, interested readers can refer to this paper but basically these three curves are fundamental bounds which cannot be broken at those block lengths or ultimately so um, so even though the polar codes are using a very menial complexity simple decoder they are they are pretty impressive in terms of their performance because they are very close to 1.4 db which is actually big these days because of the in, uh, advent of uh, ldpc codes which are pretty close to capacity but uh, this is this decoder is very simple uh, this uh, this simple decoder this performance is already impressive enough once you change this decoder to list decoder list decoder which will be built based on this vanilla decoder which based on this successive cancellation decoder the list decoder will perform very impressively that will be excellent and that will come very close to the ldpc curves performance and it will in fact beat the ldpc performance once you implement this, this decoder with a with a crc check and so on as explained in a recent paper by edo tar and wadi if you are interested you can refer to that so um, basically so so if you use advanced decoders you can fill this gap of 1.5 db that's all i'm saying so uh, the gap is uh, is significant for this decoder but if you are concerned about complexity probably this is something very worth pursuing uh, this is at rate 0.5 okay so if you increase the rate what happens let's see this is another interesting result so unfortunately the gap increases the gap increases to uh, like uh, 3 db there is a 3 db gap of performance that is something not desirable in general but that's how it is so uh, the plain vanilla successive cancellation decoder will have a 3 db gap performance 3 db worse performance than what is achievable in terms of Shannon but in case you are um, wondering what is the best code available and so on um, I think LDPC codes are again much more better than this 
such a huge gap of 3 db this is 3 db gap is very huge uh, so once you use list decoders again you can probably come very close to that because they they claim that it it can perform the same as the lpc codes uh, though they show the curves only at point 0.5 in the talent wadi's uh, paper so um, yeah um, so by using list decoder you can certainly fill this gap hopefully that's all uh, so these are some interesting uh, curves that uh, you can find uh, by using uh, proper simulations at a very high block length uh, and these are some references that we have used so these are our works so our lab works so this is the fundamental paper and these this is the link of a link that contains all my uh, all my code base for the polar codes enthusiasts so this link can also be shortened as u.gd by polar codes get a quick uh, typing effort and these are the four papers the first paper is about constructions second paper is about uh, systematic polar encoding which is very exciting if you are interested you can read that and then this is a small variant of uh, the plane success cancellation decoder this is another variant which is aimed at reducing the delay of the success cancellation decoder um, just just as a reference of my background basically thank you very much for watching this uh, lecture series i think that finishes my entire uh, series of um, uh, tutorials so some basic tutorials uh, please feel free to uh, get back to me in case you want uh, to give me any suggestions, improvements, corrections or anything. So my email ID is this. Uh, I'll just write it down here. Or you can see it on the web page as well, but I'm not sure. So you can have it here. So this is my permanent email ID. Sorry for that pun. This victory is beside the someone else. But anyway, this is my email ID. Please come back to me in case you are interested. So thank you. Thank you very much. See you. See you.